boy, look what I got my hands on. This is The Case for a Creator, written by Lee Strobel. This is the third book in the series, and I haven't read either of the first two, but perhaps I shall in the future. For now, I'm going to judge this as a standalone piece. They already made a movie over the first one, A Case for Christ, and in all honesty, I don't really intend on watching it. I've been making the effort to read more, so I've also been working on Carl Sagan's A Demon Haunted World, Science is a Candle in the Dark, and it is absolutely superb, so I'd rather not waste time watching a dramatized version of more creationist folly, especially that which I cannot chop up and make a video about. But here's what I plan to do. I'm going to go through this cover to cover and dissect every topic that it goes through. I'll divide it up by chapters and interviews, but just know that this is a massive amount of material and this entire thing is going to take a long while considering my lack of free time. But let's go through this journey together, maybe we'll end up somewhere great. Probably not. The first two chapters are a backstory. I'll gloss over it since I don't have much commentary on it. So, it starts off by describing a busy newsroom and how the author is a reporter. He gets assigned to interview a backwoods, semi-violent group of Christians who are trying to get Jesus back in the classroom and what have you. So this takes place around 1974 or so. The author goes into detail about how he's an atheist at the time, and sided with evolution and common descent. He lists a few examples of what he would point to as evidence. He calls them the images of evolution, and they include Stanley Miller's experiment, Darwin's Tree of Life, Ernst Haeckel's drawings of embryos, and the Archaeopteryx fossil. Much later, the author's wife, converts to Christianity, and so Strobel goes on this adventure to seek the truth about the religion and what have you. Now, there is one thing that I will criticize in the beginning. In chapter 2, on page 27, Strobel writes, Rather than facing this unyielding despair that's implicit in a world without God, I reveled in my newly achieved freedom from God's moral strictures. For me, living without God meant living 100% for myself. Freed from Sunday being held accountable for my actions, I felt unleashed to pursue personal happiness and pleasure at all costs. Already, Strobel is an unlikable ass. Granted, he didn't generalize this inherently immoral atheist stereotype for all atheists, but he never mentions the ideas of humanism or other likewise beneficial beliefs that aren't dependent upon Yahweh or Allah or Horus or the one true god the flying spaghetti monster. Of course, he isn't exactly obligated to. This is going over him personally, and so he needs not mention that which he isn't associated with. But I would very much like to point out that selfishness and a disregard for the common good are not traits common to all atheists, and a dislike for the numerous, nonsensical rules and statements on morality outlined in the Bible is not a driving force behind the majority of atheism, as this may have its readers believe. In short, Strobel's past self sareness has nothing to do with the fact that he is an atheist, and everything to do with the fact that he was an asshole. Regardless, the real claims start in Chapter 3. So that's where we will begin our analysis. It commences with an interview of Jonathan Wells. And before reading what this man has to say, let's be responsible and look him up. Here's this Wikipedia article. I will leave a link in the description. John Corgan Jonathan Wells, born 1942, is an American molecular biologist, author and advocate of the pseudoscientific principle of intelligent design. Wow, that's harsh. Right off the bat, his own Wikipedia page says that he believes in pseudoscience, and that is a bit alarming. But let's continue in our rudimentary research. Wells joined the Unification Church in 1974 and subsequently wrote that the teachings of church founder Sun Myung Moon, his own studies at the Unification Theological Seminary, and his prayers convinced him to devote his life to destroying Darwinism. Oh, oh wow. Let's skip down to his opposition to common descent. Wells said that destroying Darwinism was his motive for studying Christian theology at Yale and going on to seek his second PhD at Berkeley, studying biology and in particular embryology. Father's words, my studies, and my prayers convinced me that I should devote my life to destroying Darwinism, just as many of my fellow unificationists had already devoted their lives to destroying Marxism. When Father chose me, along with about a dozen other seminary graduates, to enter a PhD program in 1978, I welcomed the opportunity to prepare myself for battle. Wells' statement, and others like it, are viewed by the scientific community as evidence that Wells lacks proper scientific objectivity and mischaracterizes evolution by ignoring and misrepresenting the evidence supporting it while pursuing an agenda promoting notions supporting his religious beliefs and its place. While this man is obviously drenched in skepticism, I would say that he is most definitely an unbiased, accurate source with no alternative motives hindering his research. But hey, let's cut him some slack. This is Wikipedia after all. Let's just be fair and take it with a grain of salt. Set aside what he says for a bit and take a look at his argument. Let's start on page 36, beneath Investigating the Icons. Starting at the beginning, I briefly recounted for Wells how the four images of evolution had influenced my slide into atheism. In a subtle expression of empathy, he would nod almost imperceptibly as I talked, as if to reassure me that he understood what I had gone through. In the conclusion of my story, I gestured toward a copy of his book on the desk. You included all four of those symbols in your book, along with several others, I said, and you called them icons of evolution. Why did you use that term? Wells leaned forward, putting his elbows on the desk. 
Because if you ask almost any scientist to describe the evidence of Darwinism, time after time they give you these same examples, he said. They're in our textbooks. They're what we teach our students. For many scientists, they are the evidence of evolution. Let's take a brief time out. Yes, while Stanley Miller's experiment, Darwin's Tree of Life, Ernst Teckel's drawings of embryos, and the Archaeopteryx fossils are all famous topics in the broader subject of evolution, they are most certainly not THE evidence of evolution for many scientists. One needs only an internet search engine to be flooded with an abundance of other examples. Even if Wells manages to soundly refute his icons, there's still a larger picture here. But let's continue, starting back with Strobel asking, What are the other icons? In addition to the four that influenced you, there is the similarity of bone structures in a bat's wing, a porpoise's flipper, a horse's leg, and a human hand. This is touted as evidence of their origin and a common ancestor. Then there are the pictures and textbooks of peppered moths on tree trunks, showing how camouflage and predatory birds result in natural selection. Of course, there are Darwin's finches, the Galapagos Island birds that are used to support natural selection. Probably the most famous icon, though, is the drawing that we see parodied in so many cartoons. The march of ape-like creatures as they slowly evolve into human beings, which suggests that we are merely animals evolved by purposeless natural causes. Slow down, Tiger. We'll get into your other icons later, whensoever you decide to attempt to refute them. But in regard to purposeless natural causes, why would you say merely? We are one product of about 14 billion years of universal development, and 4 billion years of evolutionary trial and error. It is absolutely remarkable to realize that self-taught, backward, conflicted beings that have been around for such a short amount of time, and who resulted from the marriage of physics and chemistry, and who continue to needlessly slaughter one another with great animosity toward their own species, are capable of practices such as radio astronomy. Sure, we may be animals, but each unique life form is a miracle in its own right, and made all the more precious by its cosmic rarity and unlikelihood. As for your purposeless natural causes, what is so bad about that? Mother Nature doesn't care about your other desires. She doesn't care how much you want to live when she throws your house around like a ragdoll in a tornado, and she doesn't care about your children when she floods your neighborhood. Why should she cater to your desire for a purpose, or to be created intentionally? The only objective purpose of any living organism is to survive, and the only reason that it exists hails from whatever means of reproduction it comes from, save for abiogenesis to which it owes its life to chemistry and chance, perhaps. If you long after a purpose so much, you can either forge one for yourself, or be told yours by other humans who claim to be in contact with a mysterious, elusive dictator of a paranormal parent. But let's get back to the book. I'm not going to go through these last few paragraphs, seeing as how they're simply settling on terminology. Feel free to pause the video and read through it if you wish, but I'm going to pick up a little further down the same page with Strobel speaking. If these icons are the illustrations most cited as evidence of evolution, then I can see why they're important, I said. What did you find as you examined them one by one? Wells didn't hesitate. That they're either false or misleading, he replied. False or misleading, I echoed. Wait a second, are you saying that my science teacher was lying to me? That's a pretty outrageous charge. Wells shook his head. No, I'm not saying that. He probably believed in the icons too. I'm sure he wasn't even aware of the way that they misrepresent the evidence. But the end result is the same. Much of what science teachers have been telling students is simply wrong. A lot of what you are personally told about the icons, for instance, is probably false. I considered the implications for a moment. Okay, let me follow your logic, I said. If these icons are cited by scientists so often because they are among the best evidence for Darwinism, and if they're either false or misleading, he said, picking up my thought, then what does that tell us about evolutionary theory? That's the point. The question that I'm raising is whether all of this is really science, or is it actually a kind of mythology? That's the very question I wanted to pursue. I decided that my approach would be to ask Wells for the straight story on each of the icons that especially influenced me. I started with the one that had the biggest impact, the picture of the tubes, flasks, and electrodes of Stanley Miller's 1953 experiment in which he shot electricity through an atmosphere like the one on primitive Earth, creating amino acids, the building blocks of life. The clear implication that life could be created naturalistically, without the intervention of a creator, had been largely responsible for untethering me from my need for God. Which god did you have a need for, exactly? I wouldn't say that there is an inherent need for a deity, since atheism is the default position. Sure, different religions sprout up in every culture across the world, and the argument that humans have a psychological disposition to desire to believe in an afterlife or deity could be made, but that's not a need. You act as if you've been tethered to a need for Yahweh since your birth, and only deceitful, evil scientists can set you on the path to atheism. I guess you could think that, but then again, you've just been had all around. You see, you're just in denial. The one true god that you actually need is the flying spaghetti monster. Don't fight him, he loves you. 